Good evening, everyone. The drinker is here with you at last, and uh, I've got a great little uh, live stream for you tonight. Um, it's probably going to be, well, I guess the second episode of Drinker's VIP Lounge. My my uh, chat was helpful enough to suggest a, a name for it after the last one. We had Sam Jones on, um, and I thought, well, it's not just like a happy hour. It's not an open bar. It's something a little bit different. So uh, we settled upon the name Drinker's VIP Lounge because I'm going to try and bring in um, each time I do this, you know, an actor or director or someone in the industry that uh, is going to be like really interesting to talk to, hopefully, and going to give us some great insights into what goes on behind the scenes. So uh, tonight I am joined by a very special guest. It's the director of one of my favorite movies of all time, Dog Soldiers, not to mention a slew of um, other movies and TV shows. Uh, he has done The Descent, which is an absolutely fantastic horror movie. Uh, he's done Doomsday, which is a great post-apocalyptic action film. Uh, he's directed episodes of Game of Thrones. He has done Black Sails. Um, he has done pretty much everything going at the moment. So I am very pleased to welcome Mr. Neil Marshall onto the show tonight. Hello, sir. Hello. Um, it's a real pleasure to be on the show, I tell you. <laughs> no, it's great to have you, man. And you've saved me for that intro because I was I was running out of uh, <laughs> breath there. <laughs> uh, no, it's great. Yeah. We 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 got introduced yeah, I mean, through. Uh, you know, I'm really really yeah. happy to be. No, it's great, man. It's great to have you on. Um, it was it was through Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett who that uh, introduced us to each other. Um, I guess he's like a mutual friend, and so um, I was very happy to hear that uh, you know you wanted to get in touch. And I thought, well, I'll chance my arm and see if you might be interested in coming on for a a live stream. So I'm very glad you accepted. We'll, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, don't no worry. It's a pretty chill stream, man. Uh, but yeah, I was just talking there about um, you know. Some of the some of the the favorite movies of yours that I've seen, um, obviously, Dog Soldiers is one that I've covered um, in both the review and um, I did like a happy hour live stream talking about it. Um, and I think it's probably the first movie of yours that I'd seen. Um, you know, and it, that's uh, that's twenty years yeah, ago now that that came out. Best movie of mine that I made. So, uh, yeah. is that is your favorite? <laughs> is it? No, it's the first. So, oh, first, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just. Uh, you know, even now I can look back on that and just I'm very impressed by just how tightly written it is, how tightly scripted it is. It's it doesn't waste a second um, and it gets you straight in, introduces you to all the main players. Uh, you get a real sense of who everyone is um, and then gets you into the action. And you had a great bunch of actors there. The dialogue is just absolutely brilliant. Like it's it's really funny really sharp um it must have, it seems like the kind of film that was just a total blast to make like i don't know if it uh, how it was it's for you guys was. um uh, yeah I, I mean as you say like and i think about all the stuff that's in it and it's only like a was it 140 minutes long or something like that so like it's pretty dense like it's people you know everything it's cut really fast and the characters and everything come everything comes at you really fast Mm -hmm. um, to get all of that stuff in there, so yeah, all the references and in jokes and, and, <laughs> yeah. and yeah, the, the dialogue and um, and I tried to you know I, tr I really did my research of trying to get the dialogue authentic to soldiers, but also bringing a bit of my own kind of sense of humor and a bit of Geordie Geordie banter and stuff like that to it. Yeah, I think um, most of us love Spoon. Um, he's just a total legendary character. You know, he's got some of the best lines. Um, yes. He just doesn't give a shit. Like, he's proper up for anything um, throughout the whole movie. And he goes out like an absolute legend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was, I mean, so many of them, they were all fun characters to write. You know, and Spoon was definitely a fun character to write because I could just see, I could see that character because I'd like, I'd known people like that all my life and seen them in pubs in Newcastle and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, I know who this person is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, just sort of seeing him come to life. And Darren, uh, what an incredible find Darren was. Uh, Darren Morford, who played Spoon, is like you know just just the perfect fit, you know. Mm -hmm. No, very much so. Um, you know, you could tell he's having fun with the role, and um, yeah, I, I think that the other thing that really jumped out about that movie is it just strikes that perfect balance between like there's obviously a lot of comedy elements to it. There's really like funny banter and stuff. But 
it, it's still a horror film and it, like it's it's a film with you know stakes and consequences you know characters get picked off one by one and you feel bad for them when they get killed you know because you really start to like them you know you start to identify with them and when you lose each one and the situation is just getting more and more desperate as the movie progresses you really feel it so i think it it, it just does that that perfect balance between drama and horror and comedy yeah, it was. I mean, it really was that thing of like, I wanted people to, to give a shit about the characters. Um, and a lot of that, you know, a lot of that comes from the actors themselves, but the amount of time that we gave to each of the characters. And also, um, I mean, kind of like the next film that I did, The Descent, which uh, we filmed a lot of it, certainly the second part of it, once they're in the house, we filmed that pretty much all in story order. So we had that whole process of like, killing off the cast you know mm. and then them leaving until it was down to like the last man on the last few days you know and that, it was pretty sad just like seeing seeing everybody go yeah yeah very much because you i don't know like um i presume the actors got along well with each other because you get a real sense of camaraderie amongst all of them like they, they they take the piss out of each other and they bicker at times but like they're a real unit when they need to be um and i think that comes across really well I, I, yeah, I swear to God, those guys would have fought and died for each other at the end of that shoot. The amount of the amount of male bonding going along. It was yeah. Really, <laughs> even like starting uh, when they arrived, because they only arrived like a couple of days before filming. And um, we couldn't afford the whole, you know, Saving Private Ryan two weeks boot camp with Dale Dye. We had a, a an ex French Foreign Legion guy. Who um, who gave gave them the runaround for like a day or something like that before we started filming, just to give them some really really basic training. And during that basic training, Kevin McKidd cracked a rib. Oh. Um, and he was he was in extreme pain, but he was terrified to uh, tell anybody about it because he thought we might send him home and replace him or something. <laughs> so he he kept quiet for the first week in agony um, until eventually he he, uh, he admitted it. But. Um, but yeah, I mean, we spent a lot of. If we weren't on set filming, we were in the bar getting pissed. And that, that was, sounds like the perfect shoot to me, man. <laughs> it was, it was great. I mean, for a first feature, and I was kind of young enough to, to handle it fully. Then was like we were literally like filming till eight o'clock at night. We were in the bar by eight thirty, and we wouldn't leave till about one o'clock in the morning, and then up again at like five to start with. And that was like right through the shoot. Um, I, I don't know. It was, we were just functioning on adrenaline, mostly. mostly. Yeah, As it the excitement of doing a film like this, I suppose. Um, and did you get a sense, like as you were making it, of you know, I think this is something kind of special because it just feels like it's working really well. Like the script seems like it's really good, and, um, and uh, all that. or did it kind of happen later that you know you started getting quite positive reception for it? Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I can remember. God, it was twenty years ago, so I don't know if I can remember. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly how it all felt on the day, but like, you know, I think I was aware that the, you know, the, the way that the actors brought such life to the script, I was aware that there was something going on there. Um, one thing that I think I've told a few times, but like one thing I, because I, I, I had six years to plan for it because I wrote the script and like oh, we didn't, we only got the financing together six years later, so I had a lot of time to think about it before we made it. And during that time, I storyboarded the entire film. I shot listed the entire film. And literally within two days or whatever of, of, of getting on set and working with the cast, I threw all of that in the bin because it was suddenly like useless. It was like in your head leading up to it, you're like, oh, I know that actor's going to go from A to B or they're going to sit there for the whole scene. And then as soon as you get actors in the room and they're like, I don't want to do that. I want to go from here to there. <laughs> yeah, we can do this. And, and, and my character wouldn't do that that way. It, it doesn't make any sense. Or we can put some energy into the scene. You're like, Oh yeah, of course, absolutely. Energy in the scene. Yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I learned I learned so much uh doing that of like, okay, you you've got to be in the moment, you've got to be ready for anything. Um and they were they were so they were so hyped up about it, you know. Uh, they were they were really bringing so much to the to the to the table that uh I wasn't going to be a fool and like going to go, "No, no, no, you must uh, the storyboard says you're standing there. So stand there." I was never going to do that. So I, I just you know adapted and improvised and overcame, but yeah, the, the military the way. way. Yeah, somewhere <laughs> on the way it was apparent that we were doing good stuff, yeah. and um, yeah, and it came together a lot in the edits. And then once you started actually showing it to people, and and holy shit, they're they're laughing in the right place and they're jumping in the right place, and 
yeah. something's working here. It's a I, hell of a reward. I, I just love uh, the bits that always make me laugh are just the resourcefulness of these guys. Like they're, uh, you know, they're, they're, they've got guns to defend themselves against these werewolves, but they're even like throwing pots of boiling water on them or, you know, Spoon will be like trying to hammer like a, a, a barricade into the door. And like one of them will be reaching through and he just starts hammering its hand <laughs> like as he's working. <laughs> just little things like that. It happens all throughout the film. Yeah, there's a lot of like everything is a possible weapon. And then I yeah. think that, uh, you know, there's what's the Terry or whatever who gets like the electric carving knife out and was like, oh, what kind of. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we got the sword, we got pans, we got boiling water, we got hammers, we got all sorts. Yeah, one uh, guy hits uh, hits it in the head with like a tap and like the blood starts yeah. coming up through the tap. <laughs> I was like throwing everything, including the, it wasn't the kitchen sink, it was the bathroom sink. Um, yeah. Think, yeah. Um, no. that was a lot of fun. I guess it's just because I, you know, I, I loved siege movies. I loved Zulu and I, you know, Rio Bravo and all these like assault and precinct 13. Mm-hmm. It was like making a siege movie, and I was just like, what can they use in the house that's like a weapon? And it just it all came from there. What I, yeah, yeah, what I like as well is that, um, you know, a lot of horror movies will have people getting chased down, you know, corridors or whatever, and they're usually on the run for something, whereas in this case. Like you say, it's a siege movie for the most part. They have to stand their ground and fight. Um, and so really, you've you've got a small number of characters in this isolated location, um, not really able to go anywhere. Um, and you'd think, you know, that could make it tricky to keep the, the film interesting, but it always manages to. Like, every time you start to settle into, like, you know, you things have been a certain way for a certain amount of time like you know we've got a certain number of characters that are still alive something else will happen to change the situation um, and just keep things progressing Um, and it never it never becomes flat like there's never a bit where you think oh it's getting a bit boring now It, it, it manages to keep that pace just just right all the way through and i think yeah it's a good combination of like a good script and good editing and and so on um yeah, that, I mean, I, I'm really pleased with it. It seems to be like a series of set pieces along the way of like, you know, some still want, they'll make a break to try and get a car and then they'll try and blow up the barn and, and things like that. So like the, every so often there's a bit of dialogue and then there's a set piece and then dialogue and there's a set piece kind of thing just to keep keep things going. I think I, I kind of picked up on um, uh, watching Raiders of the Lost Ark a lot of mm-hmm. how that breaks up into sort of almost like 10 minute segments. Uh, very much like the old serials that it was based on, but it's like every ten minutes something significant kind of happens. Mm-hmm. So it never it never gets into a lull. Um, and I I suppose I kind of applied that to Dog Soldiers quite a bit because there is something going on all the time. Yeah. Um, and because you know I think because you you get a sense of who all the characters are and you've started to bond with them a little bit, you're interested in the little dialogue moments between them. You're the character moments where you learn a little bit more about say what ryan captain ryan was actually doing there and what he's involved in or um you know you've got megan who you think is just there to help them but you discover she's she's kind of uh, one of the enemy eventually Um, yeah all those little bits that gradually come out Uh, you've got the sarge who's who's injured but then he's gradually getting better and you realize that there's something up with him like all these things just kind of build together to to build the tension i think it's it's good that the script always keeps all of that in mind you know I don't think it's always the case that because I because I liberally put a lot of black humor and stuff like that, and it's like I forget that it's actually scary for a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, because I'm so used to it and so familiar with it, and I kind of see the humor in it so much, and I'm kind of like, oh yeah, I guess some, some people really find it scary as well. Um, and it's yeah, through all the gore in and and you know. Oh cool yeah, work. big time. <laughs> yeah, lots and lots of gore. Um. Yeah. Well, the one of the things I picked up on as well, obviously, this was you know uh, done on a fairly small budget, I would imagine, and you know, there's no there's no real ability to have CGI, especially 20 years ago, um, to do this stuff. And so, when you do see the the monsters, I guess it's all done with practical effects. It's it's people in um, you know costumes, prosthetics, all that stuff. And usually you just get little quick cuts of them, so you don't see too much, but it's just enough to give you a sense of what they're they're fighting against. And again, I think that works pretty effectively. Well, I've always been like a massive fan of practical effects, and like you know, growing up in in the eighties of seeing that whole wave of films from you know American Werewolf and The Thing and things like that. 
massively inspiring for 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 me and for this movie and so when i had the chance to make this it was like i i pushed you know right from the start like it's got to, we got to have practical werewolves we could have done cgi i mean you've got to think this was well this this was like seven years after jurassic park so um you know it's not like cgi wasn't around then mm. it just wasn't particularly great then because like only a few years before my film had come out there was i think it was american werewolf in paris where they had a pretty much full CG werewolf in there, and the technology just wasn't good enough for that time. Um, and some other people had done transformations. I don't know when the when was it the Scorpion King that appeared in the mm. moment. Like, you know that level of CGI was absolutely god awful. Um, so I wanted to avoid morphing. I wanted to avoid those kind of really bad effects. Um, and so I, I just wanted to do 100% CG with like I think there's there's one CG shot of like Megan's eyes turning yellow. And that's like it. Ah, okay. Um, and a couple of shots of the moon, but I don't know if they're CG, they're just comps. But um, so, yeah, just keeping that way. But obviously, that had its restrictions. And I knew from the start, it was like, I'm never going to be able to compete with American Wealth in London for the transformation sequence. Um, that set the benchmark, and nothing's ever come close. And all the CG in the world hasn't come close. You know, the Wolfman, whatever, they're just not as good. So I was like, I'm not going to set myself up for a fall there. I'm not going to try and do a CG version because that looks shit. So I went in the opposite direction of like, what what else can I do? And I in the end, in the end, what I plumbed for was going the same route as uh, Carry On Screaming, um, with the old uh, hide behind the furniture trick. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the furniture and jumps, jumps back up and he's like made up into God knows what. I was like, let's just do that. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's, try to make a, a, a transformation sequence that look bad let's just go with that and like nobody seems to care or notice it's like you know this was never about a transformation it's just yeah. about well no like you say i mean you're never really going to be able to top something um as as intricate as um, american werewolf in london like that was just a, a brilliant piece of of special effects work um yeah and for the stage of the story where this transformation happens, it just wouldn't have been necessary. Like it kind of needed to happen quickly because it was really about, um, you know, this was like the the last stand, I guess, when it leads into that, you know, when Ryan transforms and then he escapes, like that's when the werewolves make their, their big final attack and pretty much everyone gets killed. So at that stage in the story, I don't think it would have made sense to have a big protracted transformation scene. It's, it's fine that it just happens quickly and kind of off screen. Yeah, and when you just had like Sean Pertwee like pick up a stick and go fetch, <laughs> throw a stick away, just yeah. before he, he's just after he transforms, it's kind of like, well, we're on that kind of level of insanity at this point. So, <laughs> <laughs> just, just power, power down to the end. <laughs> yeah, uh, but no, I mean, it must be good to know that um, you know, twenty years after it got made, like people are still really enjoying it, and it's become like this this cult classic, I guess. It's it's absolutely unbelievable. I mean, I never would have guest i mean there was a point when i was you know six it's six years to make but at no point during that did i ever think i wasn't going to finally get to make the film but that's just kind of the naivety of youth or whatever you know so um i cracked on got the film made but if you'd asked me then is like in 20 years time are people going to still be talking about this film um i never i never would have thought that in a million years um and and this year obviously in particular because it's the it's the 20th anniversary it's uh actually i think it was today or yesterday was like the 20th anniversary of its premiere at the uh, Brussels Film Festival. Uh, nice. That was the first time it was ever seen in public. And then in May, it was released in theaters in the UK. Um, and then, and so this year, like we've got all sorts happening. We've got um, the book about the, there's a book coming out, The Making of Dog Soldiers. Mm -hmm. That's coming out in May. Um, we got a new 4K um, release of the movie coming out later in the year. Second Sight have done this amazing uh, Blu-ray and 4K release for it. So we're just checking, doing all the grading and stuff on that now, and it looks fucking amazing. Nice. Um, and what else, what else, what else? There's a few other things going on to do with Dog Soldiers. Um, and, uh, yeah, and there may even be an interesting announcement sometime later in the year about other things. <laughs> This is this is one one thing I was going to ask you, and, and and understand if you can't tell me too much about it. But for quite a while, there was talk of a dog soldiers too, um, and well, there definitely was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, and and what became of of that at the time? You know, what was the the potential there to do a sequel? Um, well, the well, okay. So the price of getting it made was that I had to kind of sell the rights to the person who financed the film, mm-hmm. and they wanted to go off and do a Dog Soldiers two that was going to be very very different to my movie. That was kind of everything that I didn't want in my movie, they wanted to put in there. So it's like, it was going to be a bunch of like gun ho U S soldiers running around Scotland. And, um, and so they, they, I think they hired a director, but it just never got off the ground. Um, it just never happened. Um, and, and it was kind of threatening to happen for a number of years. And then there was an attempt at like a TV series, like a, a really ultra low budget TV series, um, which again, never got off the ground. So ultimately nothing ever happened with it. And then just over the past few years, myself and the producer and Kevin McKidd have kind of like all come to the consensus that should the opportunity arise and it looks like it might, then um, we'd love to revisit and do some kind of Dog Soldiers 2, but do do the film that we want to make. Because we kind of, I kind of figure the, the point for me is like, I waited 20 years. If it doesn't happen, it's kind of no skin off my back. I'd like it to happen. But I'm not going to do it if it's going to be anything less than exceptional. It's like it's got a it's a tough act to follow, so it better be bloody good. Mm. And so I'm not going to do it half assed So we're going to see. We're going to see. Cool. Well, I'll keep keep my eyes open for that one then, because uh, yeah, that'd be pretty pretty cool. Um, especially if you could keep the spirit of the original with it. You know, like you well, say, I wouldn't want to see a bunch of Americans. Be, yeah, that would be the trick. It definitely wouldn't be that. It's got to have the same flavor as the original. Obviously, you know, with the exception of Kevin Kidd, like all the cat, the original cast are dead. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've got to start. You know, I've got to kind of start from scratch and bring in a new bunch of characters somehow and give them the same flavor as the original, but without copying it, without just being a you know carbon copy. So anyway, uh, if it happens, um, you know, it will be. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah. But no, excellent, man. Um, the. Yeah, it's interesting when you were talking there about, uh, you know, in the making of this movie, you know, there was a lot of male bonding because you had essentially an all-male cast apart from from just, uh, you know, one actress in it playing Megan. Yeah, poor, um, poor Anna. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think she felt it quite a bit. Yeah. Like, she was the one girl in this, like, sea of s- smelly, sweaty guys with guns. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it but, was tough. But interestingly, you 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 kind of took the opposite approach with your next movie when um, you know you did the descent and you essentially had an all female cast for that. Um, yep. And it was great because again, when when people talk now about um, you know wanting to see better female characters represented on screen and stuff, here's a horror movie that's got basically an entire the entire cast is female, and they're all well well drawn characters. Um, and they're they're resourceful. They're smart. Um, they're they're pretty pretty fucking brave at times. Um, but they're also flawed, and they've got a lot of their own issues that they're dealing with. And they can be, you know, they're vulnerable like any person would be. And they're just interesting, multifaceted characters. And I think I actually rewatched The Descent today just pr- to prep for this stream. Um, and again, I was just really. Um, surprised again by just how well drawn they all are and how well done that was um and it, i guess it was a fairly rare thing to have a, a an all-female cast in a horror movie like this at the time um i think it I was i mean i can't think of another one uh you know we had one guy who dies in the opening credits mm-hmm. and then and it was just all the all the girls from then on and um yeah it, it was so it was partly from a a reaction to dog soldiers being like the old guys and and also just doing some research into the world of, um, you know, spelunking and and climbing and such like. And there's there's a lot of women doing those sports and was you know then 15 years ago and going out in groups of women and stuff like that. So I was like, okay, this is totally plausible. Um, you know, you can't get knocked for that. And then it was just a case of like writing, you know, characters. Obviously, like I I uh, I talked to a lot of my female friends and my sister and people like that. It was like, you know. Do these work? Do they make sense? Like, you know, just get wanted to make sure that the, the female characters were as accurate and authentic as possible and interesting and three dimensional. And as you say, like full of flaws and, and, and things like that. So, um, 
you know, it was, it was really fascinating. And then it was, it was an equally like amazing experience to do. Um, you know, the, 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 these girls really, you know, bonded massively throughout the shoot and I put them through hell. Um, cause it was a miserable shoot from a physical point of view. You know, they spent all the time like cold and wet and just being like knocked around and, and stuff like that. So yeah, it was tough, but they were amazing. They were amazing. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I was going to talk about that actually, like every time you, you watch them in a scene, you know, when you see the, the beams of their flashlights moving around, <clears throat> you can see like little droplets of, of moisture in the air. Like it's, you know, a cave and it's damp and it's drizzly. Um, and it just seems like if that's how it was throughout the whole shoot, man, that must have been tough. I mean, I assume it was done on a sound stage, but then it's very like claustrophobic environments and it just looks like it would be cold and kind of damp and miserable. <laughs> It, well, it was. I mean, it was. Um, and the, you know, the, the, there isn't a real cave in the whole movie. Um, yeah. We went. We, me and the the, the the cast went went caving in Derbyshire, um, uh, for real, like a couple of weeks before filming, just to sort of get the flavour of it. And that kind of just backed up what I already believed anyway, which was that if we tried to make it in a cave, we probably would have all died, because. <laughs> It's like astonishingly dangerous places, but also like there was only six of us, seven of us, whatever it is, in this cave. And within because it's cold and wet down there, we're like within seconds, just our breath turned the whole place into like a thick fog and you couldn't see anything. So I was like, well, you know, if we've got a whole crew in a cave, it's just like, how are we ever going to film anything? Um, so we were filming in January in Pinewood Studios and we had one of the smaller stages in Pinewood, which is like for my second feature filming in Pinewood is just like amazing. But uh, it was an unheated sound stage, so it was like freezing cold, and you could see your breath inside the stage. It wasn't refrigerated; it was just really cold. And of course, all the water and everything couldn't be heated, so that was freezing cold as well. So, if you ever seen anything about the behind of the scenes stuff, it was like literally as soon as we called cut, we got these like thermal blankets on the cast and stuff, yeah. like shaking <laughs> uh, constantly. And uh, yeah, it was just. Um, it was tough for them because it was we constantly had like hose pipes or spritzers or something just putting water in the air all the time and then half the caves were flooded or we had a waterfall or you know whatever so it was it was it was tough <laughs> yeah no but it's great but it, it, it little details like that just pay off you know like i say when you see the droplets of moisture in the air and you're just like oh okay that, that's that kind of imagines you imagine that's what a cave would be like deep underground you're really cold damp dark you know, all that all that stuff and it, it it's great um and yeah when you were talking about their, their inter we didn't like the caves either it's like we made sure the way that we shot the movie was that the and the rules that we had were that the only light sources they could have in a scene were what they took into the cave with them right. so it's snap lights or torches or fire whatever it is um so you couldn't you wouldn't get any of those like beautiful caves with shafts of light kind of coming to you know deep underground you're like where the hell does that come from um so which means a lot of the screen is pitch black but it, it, it really lent that flavor of being in a cave yeah and then you got great little um you know story devices like the um the camcorder that's got like an infrared mode and so you know the character will be using that to see a little bit and then it, it, there's a great shot the first time you see one of the monsters she's just panning it over her friends and then there's one stood directly behind one of the one of the girls and it's just like bah, straight in there it's just a great jump scare moment really like that <laughs> and that's uh so that that was shooting that sequence was that was the first time that the cast and saw or met or encountered any of the creatures we we kept them apart we, kept them apart. Ah, right. we never showed them any designs we never showed them the, the makeup. It's literally like we turned off the lights and brought in the guy. And it was uh, my friend Craig, who's the, who's the hiker at the beginning of Dog Soldiers, who gets killed, um, and positioned him behind the actresses and let them play out the scene. And so their reaction was kind of authentic. But the one that you see in the movie is not the first take. The first take, they all, like, screamed and ran off the set. Yeah. <laughs> and then... As that's... you would if you saw one of them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was, it, was, it was an authentic reaction, but it wasn't usable for the movie. Um, and then I think on, I did a couple more takes where, like, he was, like, reaching out toward the girl. And then for the last one, I said, hang on a minute. That, that looks hokey. Just stand there. Yeah. Just stand there and, like, tilt your head like you're listening. 
and, and that's what he did. And it's just it's the creepiest thing because he's just kind of like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's it's the idea the, that like it could be right behind you, and because it's yeah. so dark and stuff, and they're so quiet, you wouldn't even know that it's there. I think that's the the great like paranoia aspect of that film. And part of you is like, well, is that a guy, or is that like, is that is that like a creature, or is that like just some really creepy pervert or something that like? Yeah. <laughs> is that? Is that, oh no, he's crawling across the roof. I guess it's a creature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, when you were talking there about. Um, how the the cast were, were good at bonding and stuff and and you, you kind of ran it past friends to see um how natural they they were like I, I think that stuff works great like the early scenes where they're, they're just kind of in, they're in the cabin like the night before they're they're getting ready to do their expedition and they're just kind of drinking and dicking around and stuff their interactions all just feel very natural and um you know just the kind of dumb stuff that you would do and talk about when you're you're hanging out with your friends i think that that yeah. stuff all plays out great Oh, yeah, I, I had a lot of fun with um, I mean, the, the Juno character in particular, was uh, especially later on in the story, who kind of fluctuates from being like a hero and a villain, you know, from moment to moment. It's like one minute is like she's awesome and she's the savior and she's killing the creatures. And the next minute she's accidentally killing one of the, the other girls and like lying about it. And she's already betrayed one of the other girls. And so I think I think that level of character just really interests me that they – you can be both a hero and a villain at the same time. Very much so, and um, yeah, that you've you've then got two layers of like threat. Like you've obviously got the creatures that are hunting you, and you've potentially got members of the group turning against each other as as Absolutely. you know they're put into these it's desperate first, survival yeah. situations. And and you know, there's like there's essays being written about like what does it all mean, and is it really just in Sarah's head? And I mean, like Sean McDonald's like just an amazing performance. But there's little clues throughout of like medication next to her bed and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. She hasn't taken it and things, and it's like, well, is it all actually a figment of her imagination? Um, and I, I, I don't want to say one way or the other. It's like I love that people want to analyze it and think about it on those levels, but I don't want to give away. You know, there's no right answer. Well, you've got that great double end into it as well because I know they they kind of changed it for the American audiences where. Um, in the original version, you know, she, you think she's escaped from the the cave and and, and driven away in the car, um, and she she sees a vision of her friend, um, and then like in the American version, that's where it stops. It's like it, she's she's escaped. It's implied that she's escaped, but she's traumatized. So happy ending for her. Then in the full version, it's like, nah, that was just her fantasy because she was like, you know, about to get murdered by these things, and she was just desperately trying to think of something happy as in her final moments. Um, that's that's just such a bleak end, and it's great. Well, the thing is, is like I I I, I have a totally different point of view on that as to which one's the most bleak ending. Because it's like in that ending, yes, yeah, she ends up trapped in the cave, but in her own mind, because she's gone insane, she's with her daughter who died, and so she's happy. Uh, in the other ending, yes, she does physically escape, but all her friends are dead. She's probably going to get accused of killing some of them. You know, she's clearly lost her mind. She's lost her daughter. She's lost her husband. Mm. Is that a happy ending? I don't know. She's not going to have a very good life after that. She's that, going to that be is very true. straight into the, 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 the mental asylum, and then that's the end of her. Um, <laughs> so I don't know which I argue which one's the happy ending. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think if it was down to me, I, I'd probably take the mental asylum over, over being eaten by horrifying cave monsters. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. But yeah, the the um, you know, the creature design and stuff is great, and it, it makes sense because you know, I guess the idea was that they live underground and there's no light, so they don't really need vision anymore. They can't see as such, but they hear and they they, they sort of sense their prey. Um, and the characters uh, yeah. figure that out fairly quickly that they, as long as they don't make a noise, they can kind of avoid them. I try to kind of model them on bats and things like that using kind of sonar and things and trying to scuttle across ceilings and, you know, they've adapted. I was I said that they're, they're the caveman who stayed in the cave, basically, mm -hmm. and kind of evolved into the cave, whereas most of us came out of the cave, they, they, these lot went deeper into the cave and evolved that way. And, uh, yeah, they've been down there for thousands and thousands of years. It's... Uh... It, it reminded me a little bit of an old horror movie that I reviewed um, a few months back um, called Deathline, and it's yes. um, set in the London Underground. And, you know, obviously it's not cavemen, but it's a, a similar idea of, like, you know, 
tunnel workers from like 150 years back who got sealed down there and they've, they've just been like breeding and, and you know living down there scratching out existence ever since then and it's a similar idea like they've de-evolved almost from humans down to like animal sort of level was it uh mind the gap yeah it- yeah yeah that's <laughs> creepy man because that's all he can say he's just going like mind the gap um <laughs> yeah it's horrible stuff <laughs> That's good. I mean, a, a, another similar thing that I'd read about beforehand was uh, Sony Bean. You know Sony Bean? Sony Bean? Um, yeah. No, what's that? So Sony Bean uh, was from, it was a, a like a massive killer in D- Dumfrieshire. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, right in the kind of, when was it, Elizabethan area? I think it was at least good in time. Anyway, he had a family. He he had a family. They lived in a cave, and they they dragged people into the cave and ate them. And they had there was hundreds of them. Ah, oh, yes, that's coming back to me now. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great story. Yeah. I it's, it's never been made into anything, but it's a great story. It's only been they used to go out and um, like mug people and um, on the highways, and then just take them back to the cave and feed them to the children. Charming. <laughs> <laughs> No, that, no. That was inspiration for the descent as well yeah no i i think um you know it's just a great like little concept for a horror movie you know i love the idea of um particularly in this film you find out that the cave that they're in they thought that they were going to some tourist attraction but it's actually some unexplored cave that no one's ever been in before um or so they think um and i just love that idea of venturing down into this like whole underground world that nobody's set foot in for you know hundreds or even thousands of years it's just such a cool idea and then you know that idea that oh there's something down here with us we can't see it but we know it's here um, well, there's a lot of caves out there that, that haven't been explored so yeah i you know tapped into that for sure yeah um, and you get the little you know you there's there's quite often in movies like this there'll be like another group that went in first and you know you just find little bits and pieces of them like a kind of clues about what happened to them and yeah you get that in this one as well it's pretty cool yeah the old the old mining gear from the, the prospectors going down there yeah i think it was, like i said it in um the appalachian mountains it's kind of like where deliverance was set so yeah. you know and that is a big kind of caving area there's a lot of caves there that people go caving in and a lot of unexplored caves there as well and i just thought having an unexplored cave in an area that is also like synonymous with like deliverance and kind of crazy backwards you know people or whatever it was like it just adds to the whole unnerving aspect of it of a holiday that goes horribly wrong yeah <laughs> um i love as well like um you know when it comes to doing like physically demanding scenes you know the movie makes it look genuinely difficult like where there's a point where they have to cross this really deep chasm and the only way to get across is to basically hang from the roof and put in these like batons into the the gaps in the ceiling you kind of have to put one in and move a little bit further and when you see the actresses doing it 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 looks genuinely difficult because they're having to like hang by one arm and like try and get the other one to to use the the clamp in um and they're you know they're really groaning with the pain of holding themselves up and i like that because a lot of other movies would have just had them you know stood stood on a platform just out of sight and make it look really easy and it's like no this would be really hard and you want to make it tense and difficult it was physically arduous for the actors, but it was very important, I think, for the whole story as well, that, that we put them through some climbing challenges as well within the, within the cave environment and make it you know, as perilous as it really would be down there. And also it's kind of like showing that, that there's no easy way back. They can't just turn around and go back that way very easily. So, um, yeah, I had a lot of fun just like building up tension with sequences like that. And then before you even get to any of the creatures, the creatures are really only show up like 40 minutes from the end of the film. So, mm-hmm. I love the first little glimpse you get of one as well. It's like at the end of a tunnel and you just see it in the flashlight um, and it sort of looks up and then just out of sight. You know, I, I just love like little glimpses of something. You, you know it's yeah. there, but then it's just gone before you can get a good look at it. But that's 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 the that's the really creepy stuff. That's the kind of stuff that shows up on YouTube all the time now. It's like those little glimpses in torchlights. You know, loads of people are doing those videos yeah. of uh, glimpsing something horrendous in the darkness. But yeah, so that was kind of what I had in mind. Was like, oh shit, when you do catch something in a torchlight, it disappears. It's like, yeah. fuck it, what's that? <laughs> 
no it's uh it's really good and um yeah like i say i, I think the just like with dog soldiers i think the casting was really good um again you've got like a, a relatively small group of characters in this isolated situation you know they've got to try and overcome challenges and stuff and they gradually fragment and get picked off and um yeah all, all this those classic elements of like the horror slasher movie are just all there and it's yeah i think it works really well and it's got that that nice bleak ending i suppose that um yeah doesn't yeah i didn't think there was room for a happy ending in that one <laughs> no, no. And i think also because it's like it was um so like the whole film was met kind of conceived as a sort of response to a review of dog soldiers that had said that like Dog Soldiers is is good, but it's funny, and it's like, well, when's a British filmmaker going to make a really genuinely scary horror film again? And I kind of thought, oh, there's, there's the gauntlet's been thrown down there. Um, so when I went when I wrote Descent, I was just thinking like, how dark can we go here? And that meant having a bleak, miserable ending because like some of my favorite horror films, like The Thing, for example, have a really bleak, you know, ending yeah. of like, quite how does it end? You know, and I love that. I think for me as well, like the key to to make me get really invested in a horror film is have the cast or, and the character, sorry, be one likable but two smart, um, and that's what you get here. Like they actually make pretty smart decisions for the most part. Like it, nothing pisses me off more than a horror film than people just making obviously dumb, you know, decisions because the script calls for it or whatever, and they're just there to get killed off, and so you don't really care because. You know they're, they're too stupid to survive something like this whereas these the girls you know are making smart choices for the most part they're using like their um you know their lighter to look for like little gusts of wind that will lead them the way out just little stuff like that um they're even like trying to conserve their resources by retrieving their ropes and and all that because they know they're going to need it further on and again it's just it all helps to build up that um that feeling of a smart group of people you know they're not invincible but like they're doing yeah. their best under pretty difficult situation yeah when smart people get into trouble you know they're in real trouble so uh, yeah yeah it's, it's very much that thing of of yeah I, I don't like it either i think you know dumb characters making dumb decisions i mean yes some of these characters make stupid decisions but it's usually like in a moment of blind panic under extreme duress or something like that where like they just have to make a decision very quickly and they make the wrong one and that's that's just the way it goes but uh um, but most of the time, yeah, they're trying to make smart moves. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I guess what's interesting as well, when we look at the, the films that you did at that point, you know, you did, um, you know, a horror film with some comedy elements or black comedy elements in Dog Soldiers. You then did a straight up horror movie with um, the, the Descent. And then you kind of moved on to like horror slash apocalyptic um action movie with doomsday so you kind of went through the whole gamut of like horror um to like with comedy then just straight up horror and then action mixed in as well so it's like a nice little trilogy of movies you know um i certainly wanted to bring my horror sensibilities to doing a uh, an action post-apocalyptic movie for sure so i think you know uh, doomsday is as bloody as either of the two films that preceded it even though yeah. it's <laughs> so you know, Centurion is kind of the same, really. But uh, yeah, Doomsday was a Doomsday was a hell of a lot of fun. I, I I look at Doomsday now and think like I can't believe that somebody gave me the money to make that. Like, yeah, <laughs> and you got to direct Rona yeah. Mitra, which is just fantastic. <laughs> I'm a big fan of hers. Absolutely, it was awesome. Like just you know what a, what a what an adventure it was to go to South Africa and make that film <laughs> and have all these toys at our disposal. A great cast. I mean, you know, not, not only Rona, but like Bob Hoskins as well, Malcolm yeah. McDowell. I mean, legend. Yeah. So, yeah, it was. I had a lot of toys to play with on that one. Um, um, and yeah, it, I don't know, man. It seems kind of timely as well, like a virus that's ravaged uh, like large parts of the country and forced people into quarantine and stuff. <laughs> well, that's, I, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like, I thought that for sure, but also like, um at some point i think the border of england and scotland was shut down yeah and they weren't letting people through and i was like all they're gonna do is build a wall and it's doomsday it's like it's yeah, happening put, put some of them <laughs> automatic guns that shoot shoot at people like <laughs> like you get in the film <laughs> get so much shit for that rabbit i tell you yeah yeah i think it's great i think that's pretty funny that scene <laughs> well, that's the thing i was whenever i watched it with an audience i always knew like if they laughed at the rabbit they're going to enjoy the rest of the film 
if they didn't yeah. laugh at the rabbit, they're probably not going to enjoy the rest of the film. <laughs> so, yeah. It's an interesting concept as well, because, you know, you're so used to movies like this where the whatever virus goes around will turn people just into mindless zombies or um, just straight up kill them or make them into mutants or whatever. And in this case, it's more like it's just made them go a bit nuts. Um, and so they've, they've developed their own like primitive and extremely violent societies as a result. Um, and so it's, it's something a little bit different, I suppose. Well, I wanted to kind of be a little bit more authentic about viruses of like, yeah, it just kills you. Now, that's it. That's what it does. It kills you. And, and look, some people are going to survive just by natural immunity, but it's just going to kill the rest of them. Um, and I had, you know, I had so many people asking of like, oh, he's doing a virus movie. So it's going to be a zombie movie. I'm like, no, it's not, it's not a zombie movie. You know, <laughs> yeah. viruses don't, don't always produce zombies. Um, so, yeah, I had to sort of get that into people's heads that it was not about zombies, just about a virus. But actually, the virus is, it starts the story. But then after that, it's like, what happened next? It's like yeah. it killed a bunch of people. Yeah, and you've got your your team that's been sent in to try and get answers and so on. And um, you know, then it becomes your kind of survival situation where they're being hunted and they've got to try and you know fight people off. They got to survive. A lot of them get killed. And yeah, it's it's you know it's got all your elements of a kind of apocalyptic action movie. Well, I wanted to do, you know, the kind of films that were being made elsewhere, the Mad Maxes and the, you know, that kind of stuff was like nobody, well, I can't say nobody had ever done it in the UK before. There's a handful of post-apocalyptic movies in the UK. Um, you know, obviously 28 Days Later, um, there's a film from the 60s, I think, called No Blade of Grass, mm -hmm. which is a post-apocalyptic kind of thing with marauding biker gangs and stuff like that. Which is quite fun, but um, but other than that, like you know, the UK has not seen an awful lot of big epic action movies on that scale. So it was like a real pleasure to do something like that for a UK audience and put Scotland on screen and you know destroy Glasgow and stuff. <laughs> so. Yeah, <laughs> I will want to do that. You know, um, yeah, like I uh, I remember because I, I was like an extra back at, at that time. And um, some of the guys I was chatting to had worked on Doomsday. Um, and did you not film part of it in Blackness Castle? Um, yes. And there was like a big battle scene there. And um, you, you, there was a bit where there was going to be a loads of pyrotechnics were going to go off, but you didn't tell anyone that it was going to happen in order to get like a kind of uh, honest reaction out of people. So all this shit exploded and like the extras who were in the middle of doing their staged fight and were like, what the fuck? Like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did that. <laughs> <laughs> That's I mean, we, no, nobody was in any like harm's way, but it was like in order to get a genuine reaction, it was definitely like, eh, let's not tell everybody what's going to happen. I mean, because yeah. it's also it's one of those things. Unless you've seen pyro, because it wasn't pyros; it was all um, air mortars. Uh, it was used air mortars now, which looks like an explosion, but it's just a big massive blast of air with debris and smoke and stuff like that. And we had a ton of them set up in this castle to blow out all the windows and all this kind of stuff. Um, so, but you can't really like you can only tell people so much about what's going to happen. And then you know, once they try and like fake a reaction, it's just like now nah, just react to it. Yeah. <laughs> so. I think the, the, the thing, the, I guess the thing there is like, you're only going to get that reaction once, yeah. you know, like they're going to know what's going to happen next time. So I guess you have to get the cameras just right, you know, if you're going to get it. Yeah. So yeah, we were at Blackness Castle. We were in Glasgow for quite a bit. We filmed a few street scenes and we dressed up a whole block there to look like it was abandoned and, and such like. So yeah, we did a, a few bits in Scotland. And and um, I can't remember what it was called. Uh, there's a dam where the hell was it? Um, anyway, there's there's a few other locations up in the Highlands that we used. Yeah. yeah. And then the rest of it was all Cape Town. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, that's pretty pretty awesome. Like, obviously, to see places like Black Nest Castle, like, or places like Glasgow and stuff that I recognize on screen, it's always fun. You know, it's always nice to see stuff like that. Yeah. Um, that was a great it's... location. It really helped us. Yeah. Um, and I, I think if you're looking for a post-apocalyptic nightmare as well, like Glasgow's the perfect place, man. You don't even have to dress it up. It's just ready to go. You could pretty much just bring the locals in. They'll be ready to start fighting. Yeah, I've had a, I've had a few post-apocalyptic nights out there, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I, I like uh, – it's it's a good, fun movie. 
you know I, I love all the costumes and everything like they're so you know everything's like super like elaborate and decorated and stuff because these people have spent like ages like ornamenting all their their outfits it's really cool um yeah, i'm doing yeah. the different gangs you had the sort of the punk gang in glasgow and then you had the, the kind of the medieval gang but even like the medieval lot there's like they're mixing up sort of like armor with like modern combat outfits and stuff like that um which is kind of a lot of fun um yeah. and I, I really like that that aspect of of it's like it comes across you get so absorbed into the historical aspect at the end because there's like knights running around and castles and then there's just little giveaways of like the gift shop sign and things like that in the background to remind everybody that this is actually in the future it's not a, it's not a historical movie they haven't yeah. gone into time travel this is the future <laughs> Mm. And was, I tried to put some kind of logic into it of like, well, you know, these castles have stood for thousands of years. They're probably going to stand for another thousands of you know, thousand years. That's a pretty good place to make your home and that kind of society. Um, you know, Mad Max, they don't have castles in Australia, so they couldn't do anything like that. But in Scotland, they do. So I was like, why not hide in a castle, make it your fortress? And if it's a museum, it's probably got all these kind of medieval suits of armor and stuff. So why not use those as well? And the swords and the axes and things. You know. No, absolutely, because yeah. guns will run out of ammo eventually, and you know, like things like um, primitive weapons are going to be the things that last, I suppose. Absolutely, so, makes sense. I mean, it's it's almost a shame you couldn't have used Edinburgh Castle. That would have been epic, man, to, to film in that. That would have been good. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't, I don't think they would let you like take over that place for weeks to do like shooting. Unfortunately, <laughs> never mind. So. Well, you would have been able to do the pyros. Yeah. <laughs> um but yeah i mean so you know i guess you kind of got started off on like a real track with horror movies and and um you know they were all kind of um, different ways of exploring that genre but um you know did you then want to move beyond that and do different things or were you interested in exploring other different variations of the horror genre or what like what did you kind of want to move on to after doomsday um well i think i'd always I've always got like one foot in the in the horror genre some way or other because I love that genre so much. But at the same time, I never wanted to be pigeonholed as a horror director because um, yeah, because you know the films that you know made me want to make movies aren't just horror movies. You know the you know the main inspiration for wanting to be a film director in the first place is um, it's probably this film here, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, that that's the film that made me want to direct. Um, so I always wanted to do all kinds of movies. Um, so after, you know, Doomsday was a bit of a departure going into kind of a post-apocalyptic science fiction, dark genre, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then the next step up after that was Centurion, which is like a, it's a historical action piece, but still has oodles of blood. <laughs> so yeah. ultra, ultra violent action piece. Yeah. Will we ever get, um, you know, a Raiders of the Lost Ark type movie from you, like a, an adventure movie, like treasure hunting, all it's, that kind of thing. It's written. Uh, I've been trying to get it off the ground for years, but just haven't been able to, to, to do it because it requires a little bit of money. And, you know, it's just things just, it's also, it's kind of a tough sell in today's market, you know, if it's not based on a book or a video game or whatever, it's an original idea. So, um, yeah, it's a tough sell. Um, it's getting it's getting like a cast member attached or something like that. If you can get one actor attached to play the hero or something, then maybe that's enough to kind of get it across the line. But uh, I'll keep going. But it's there. I've been trying to make it for quite some time. To to see something like Raiders of the Lost Ark done with the sensibilities of something like Dog Soldiers just seems like an absolute match made in heaven for me. Like I think that would be fantastic. <laughs> A bit of that going on for sure, yeah. Um, but yeah, I've got, I've got a few ideas that are sort of in that kind of realm, and a TV series that's in that kind of realm as well. But uh, yeah, this one film would be my dream project if I could ever get it made. No, I hope it happens for you, man. Um, the the other thing I, you know, I was going to talk to you a little bit about, like I know you've also done a lot of TV work, um, and you've directed a couple of episodes of Game of Thrones, particularly. Um, uh, particularly the one, the the Battle of Blackwater Bay, like that's that episode, man, is just an absolute classic. I think 
properly epic, you know. Um, was... I think that was one of the first episodes where you really got a sense of how how massive in scale this show was. Um, it was the first time because, like, the, the the finale of season one was like the you know I think it was Tyrion gets knocked unconscious and he wakes up and the battle's over and it was like mm-hmm. they skipped on the battle and I think when the, they got to the end of the season two and they were like we have to deliver something here for the fans you know we have to deliver for the audience and make good this promise that we've been doing for two seasons now so they so they, you know so it was going to be the battle of blackwater and um and I, and i i'd come off centurion um and for some reason the director who was going to do battle of blackwater had to drop out at the last minute so a lot of my crew from centurion went on to work on game of thrones so they found themselves without a director for the biggest episode they were going to do. And thankfully, their stunt coordinator, Paul Herbert, who was on Centurion, and the horse master, Camilla Napru, both kind of went to the producers and said, give Neil a call. He's just done Centurion. Have a look at it. He did a battle in that for, like, no money and shot in a couple of days. Check it out. And um, and the producers gave me a call and just said, you know, do you want to come and direct the biggest episode of Game of Thrones we're doing? And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> like, let I... me check my schedule. <laughs> like, I have to prepare. And they were like, well, uh, this is on a Saturday. They were like, well, you've got to start on nine o'clock Monday morning. You've got a week's prep and then we start shooting. And I'm like, and it was at first it was like, holy shit. And I was like, okay, let's just, let's just go for it. What the hell? So yeah, we had a week's prep to do that. Not, it was a busy shit, week. Man. Yeah, I would imagine. Week. But uh, um, yeah, we we did it for canal, and it was a crazy shoot as well. I mean, it was in Belfast in like October, November, freezing cold, pouring rain, mud up to our knees every night, just nuts. But everybody was awesome, I and mean, it was a great bunch, really good bunch. Yeah, I mean, I was gonna say like you've obviously when you're doing something like Game of Thrones, you've got a hell of a big cast to be working with there. You know, there is a lot of people involved in that. There is, but like weirdly, the two episodes that I did were those episodes that were kind of primarily in one location for the whole show, which was actually quite unusual. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get to work with a lot of the cast. I was worked with a select bunch on Blackwater, and I had like I had Tyrion, I had like Lena Headey, and you know all the people that were in the red fort, and then um, uh, Liam Cunningham, of course, who I worked with on Dog Soldiers. Anson yeah, Jr. that must have been cool. Eh? <laughs> it was awesome to see him again, and also awesome to blow him up. I got to yeah. blow him up. The road, which was fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, that so that was great. And then the next episode, I came back. It was a whole. It was all the the, the you know the Black Watch guys. So it was uh, you know Kit and and, uh, and Rosie and all. It was it was a whole different cast. So there's but there's an awful lot of the cast that I never got to to work with or meet. Yeah. Oh, that's. Um, I mean. I was going to talk as well about that that other episode because that's the one where um, Igrid gets killed um, yes. during the the fight in it. I think it's Castle Black, isn't it? Um, yeah. And yeah. damn, yeah, that was that was a tough well, I episode. Few, yeah, I had a few, in that episode. I'd like I had to kill off quite a few favorite characters, and obviously her death was the most significant. And yeah, had to had to get that right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, it's such a you know. When it was at its peak, like it was a show where you just you never quite knew what was going to happen from episode to episode. Um, it could spring horrible deaths on you, you know, like really shocking twists and turns and stuff. And I think that was what what kept it so compelling is like you just never you never felt yeah. like anyone was safe. Yeah, exactly. Nobody was safe. I mean, that was it. Like watching the first season for the first time, and like holy shit, like they've killed their leading man. Like and they're thinking, like, Fuck, where's uh, it going to happen now? So. Yeah, so it was that case of like anybody could die at any time. Nobody was precious, and uh, yeah, that was cool. It's like it does make me laugh now because it's like, oh my god, who would have thought Sean Bean would have got killed on screen? You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, poor old Bean. It's not like Pertwee; he's always getting killed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that I, I guess I've tackled a little bit on my channel is like. Um, you know that real feeling that that um, Game of Thrones kind of um, really tapered off in terms of quality in the final 
couple of seasons. Um, they rushed it and stuff. Like, I mean, did you keep up with it? Like when you weren't directing, like you were still watching it, or did you just kind of move on to other stuff and you weren't too too across what was happening there? No, I mean, first and foremost, I was a fan. You know, I mean, when, when I say when I when I got that that um, I got the job directing Battle of Blackwater, I hadn't seen any of it at that point. I'd seen some trailers and stuff, and I thought, you know, this is right up my street. Um, but they sent me the whole first season. I watched the whole first season in a day um, before I went to Ireland to shoot it and uh, was immediately hooked then. And then what happens when you direct it is like you, you direct it, you do your cut of it like for a few days afterwards, and then you leave and you don't see it again until it's actually out, until it's broadcast. Um, so it was always like interesting for me to like go and direct an episode and have to wait like, you know, whatever it is now, a year or six months for the season to come out. And then finally watch your episode at the end of the season. And then I was, but I was hooked anyway. So I, like, I kept up with the whole thing and watched the whole thing all the way through. And yeah, I agree that something, something was amiss with the last, the last season or two seasons or, you know, when they abbreviated it or whatever it was they did. But um, I think part of it was that, that it seemed very clear that when, you know, when they started the whole thing, they didn't know how it was going to end. And a lot of that was down to, like, you know, obviously George R. R. Martin hadn't written the books yet. So um, figuring out who was going to end up on the throne felt like something of an afterthought at the end of the day. I honestly thought they just pinned a bunch of characters to a dartboard and just put, closed their eyes through a dart at it and just see who it lands on. It's like, oh, Bran. Okay, yeah, fine. Let's just do Bran. You know, it felt so so weird and so unearned like now oh, suddenly he's king of, of everything now like what, what especially if you're gonna go back and watch the whole thing because isn't there like a whole season where he just like he disappears oh yeah movie? like i told i kind of forgot that he was even still alive at one point like he's gone yeah. for that long um and yeah it just it, it felt like a weird choice and yeah so much of that that final season was just rushed to get it done um and it's it doesn't make any sense to me because I know HBO was up for doing a couple more seasons, um, but the writers. I get, it, I, I, I get it from the you know from the writers' point of view. They'd been doing this, you know, they'd been working for eleven years on this thing, you know. So I was kind of like, they just wanted to get it done, but that still doesn't really explain the whole drop off in quality. Yeah, um, and it's almost like the more money they had, the less effort they seemed to put into it. Um, you've got all these incredible, you know, battle scenes and um, and set pieces and stuff because obviously, you know, they were becoming more and more successful, so they could throw as much money at it as they wanted. But then yeah. all the stuff that made those early seasons so interesting, all the the betrayals and the politics and the the alliances between characters, all that character driven stuff, just kind of got forgotten about. And it was uh, yeah, it was just kind of sad to see it. It's, it kind of brought the show down then. A bit, yeah. I was hoping Liam was going to end up on the throne. I think that would have made me happy. I mean, I'm pleased that he made it to the end. Honestly, he's not the kind of character I thought yeah. was going to survive. <laughs> yeah, I was like, no way he's going to make it to the end. But yeah, he did. I was like, fuck yeah, Liam made it to the end. But I say the problem is, is that because the ending is a disappointment, it makes the rewatchability of the whole show difficult. Like on a really great show, like, I don't know, something like Battlestar Galactica. I've watched that all the way through, like, at least twice, if not three times. But, um, you know, because the, the whole thing is a satisfying journey. And other shows are like that too. But if you, I'm not going to – I find it difficult to start Game of Thrones knowing where it's going to end up. Yeah. And like, ultimately, it's going to peak and it's going to go down downhill. And and for it to be – have a longevity and to, to be that thing that people will want to watch in the future, it's like it's – or watch again – it's got to have a satisfying conclusion so that you can like feel it. It is, yeah. And if you know it's going to have a, a crappy ending, um, the the payoff's not there, so you're not going to appreciate the setups so much. Just like you say, um, I think you know you could watch the first I don't know five seasons um, and just pretend it sort of ends there. It's like, oh well, they never finished the show. What a shame! But like the, those five seasons were great, <laughs> you know. Could do that. Could do that. But it's it's kind of like Lord of the Rings or whatever, you know setting out on that journey with the characters and watching the whole trilogy or the extended editions or whatever it is, knowing yeah. that at least it's going to be a satisfying conclusion. It's like, I'll go on that journey. Oh, that, I mean, that's one of those uh, just great 
cinematic trilogies where they just nailed it. They got it exactly right. Um, you know, we we just did a stream um, last week where we talked about the two towers and we were just having a whale of a time, like just gushing over how well done it was and stuff. Um, yeah, amazing trilogy. But then, you, you know, I, I don't know how you feel about something like the Hobbit trilogy, but for me, it was like, oh, God, it feels like it was made by a completely different group of people. Um, just felt very, very cartoonish, very overdone on action, um, you know, very heavy on CGI and just not not up to that same level of quality. Um, and it was a real shame. Yeah, I think that's very much the difference is that it felt CGI heavy. It felt like. What I love about the first film, particularly the first film of the first trilogy, is so much of his locations. Mm -hmm. uh, it it kind of gets a little bit less as the films go on. It's like you start to feel a little bit more green screen coming in. Um, but in the Hobbit trilogy, it felt like with the CG characters, a lot of CG backdrops, it just, the whole thing didn't feel as authentic and like it didn't embrace the New Zealand of it all that the original trilogy did so well and gave it that authenticity. I like yeah. that. Um, I, I mean, honestly, so many of those landscape shots that you get in that first movie, I, I f was convinced they were just CGI'd somehow because they're so epic. They're so in like the mountains that they're trekking through are so beautiful. You're like, no, the, a place like this can't exist. This has to be fake somehow. <laughs> and it's <laughs> it's real. It's just New Zealand, you know? It's yeah. a crazy place. Oh, it's amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the, the other, like, I guess, the other movie that you've done recently um, that a lot of people will, will know you for is Hellboy, um, which is like a, a kind of reboot of the, you know, the ones that we got with Ron Perlman from a few, you know, from 10 years ago or so. Um, and that was, I think, David Harbour that they'd like recast as Hellboy. Um, yeah, well, don't blame me for all that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I was going to ask because um, I haven't seen the new one, so I, I I'm not too well like up on it. Like I know it didn't get amazing reviews, but like what what was your experience of working on it? How was it for you? It was shit. <laughs> <laughs> it was the, it was the worst professional experience of my life. Yeah. What what went wrong? What happened? Um. Well, for a for a start, the script was shit, and I. <laughs> The, the decision to make the film was a mistake you know i mean i signed up to it because they pitched this idea of like we want to do the horror version of hellboy we want to kind of bring you and like make it really dark and do the horror version and uh and then i quickly found out that like a the script was terrible b it was never going to get better before we shot it despite many many attempts you can't polish a turd no matter how much you try <laughs> yeah and and I would have all creative control kind of taken away from me and uh, to, to the extreme levels. Like there was just, there's nothing of me in that movie. And, and the worst part about it is that what they did in post was like, they filled it full of this really bad CG gore. And I think a lot of people assume it's like, well, that's my hand all over the film, but actually it's not at all. Um, I didn't really have anything to do with that. And I would have done as much practical as I possibly could, but we kind of, we didn't get to do that. So um yeah, it was just it was just god awful. So it's 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 not a film that I would like. I I consider to be part of my canon. It's the only film that I that I've made that I that I didn't write, um, and <laughs> I won't make that mistake again. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean it's like is it, it's going to be like an Alan Smithy job at one point, you know? Um, <laughs> it might well have been. I mean, the thing is, is like yeah, you know, it is. You know, it's a blot on my my, my, my resume for sure. Uh, but it was an, it was a great learning experience for me in the sense that I you know make basic decisions make the right choices for the right reasons, and the problem was uh, that I hadn't been able to make a feature for like nine years. Um, I'd been working in the television space, but no matter how many uh, I was based out in LA, I'd been working in television and thoroughly enjoying that and doing great stuff. But all the time I was trying to get features off the ground. And just couldn't quite get there, and it was, a lot of it was to do with the um, the whole landscape was changing, because the, the budget levels that I'd been working in was now kind of gone. That everything was either like super huge tentpole Marvel movies, or like ultra low budget things, and the films that I was kind of making were not being made anymore. So I was really struggling to kind of get get a film made, and then suddenly along comes this opportunity to do Hellboy. And they, they, you know, the, the pitch that they sold to me of doing this horror film was like, great, I get to do a feature. It was like the biggest budget I've ever had. 
and then got there and it was just like you know just got trampled all over and they just made a mess of it we really did it's a, and it's a shame because i think there is a good hellboy movie out there to be done but that's not it yeah i mean it, this is i guess this is a frustrating thing and this is um why it's interesting to talk to people like yourself to get that that other perspective on it because it's easy for people like me who you know review movies um to lay the blame on the director and say like well you just you didn't direct a good movie there um but then it we don't know the the amount of um like career, actual control that they had over the film and how much interference there is um how many things are mandated by the studio and stuff and then like as you kind of describe it there it, it's like you're just kind of a proxy director and you, like all the the decisions are kind of taken by other people and it must just be an immensely frustrating experience and especially if the movie doesn't do well and you're kind of getting blamed for it and it's like well it's not really my fault because i didn't really have a hand in most of this stuff it's pretty soul destroying yeah i mean like when you're on set trying to block a scene with the actors and you've got a producer who keeps on like just butting in and giving them different directions <laughs> like you know and then and and it's bad for the actors it's bad for, for for the film it's bad for everything and you know the end result is what you get you know and i think there's also like there's a problem with almost being too faithful to the, the source material mm -hmm. um that some of the stories that we were basing it on had massive like logic holes in them but mm -hmm. they, but it was made so faithful to that it was like and and didn't matter how many times you point out there's like this makes no sense it's like yeah but this is what it says and this is what it says in the text so this is what we're going to do it's like well it might it might work great in a comic thing it does not work in a film and you know and it didn't yeah damn i mean it's um yeah like i when you were mentioning there like the the kind of middle ground of movies you know where you've got maybe a, a 10 20 million dollar budget or something like relatively small but like there's not too much getting gambled on it and so you can afford to take risks and you can afford to do something a bit more creative um if those movies are getting squeezed out and so what you've got is just the extreme at either end where you've got basically no budget to work with in which case you're really constrained in what you can actually make um, yes. or you've got these big 100 200 million dollar you know juggernauts that they're gambling so much money on it that they're not willing to take any risks really and then you end up with producers and studios interfering in everything um yeah, it, there, there's to. no there's no real market then for creativity or people to just um be able to experiment and and do things that are really different and interesting with enough of a budget that they can actually realize it you know and that's a, that's a real yeah. shame for the industry like even 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 indie filmmakers have to eat so, so yeah. <laughs> so many micro budget films you can make but like you know it's not a way to make a living really um you know unless you can figure out something something some other way of making a living like you know wash windows or something in, in between but um yeah it's it's it is tough because like the weird thing is is like the, the so the film that i did directly after hellboy uh the reckoning um we did that for that was a kind of very very low budget movie um and the difference was that like i'd gone from like doing like a 50 million movie to doing a 2 million movie um but i had 100 percent creative control over it and although like i you know although i got paid like fuck all i think i lost <laughs> the movie um it was a way more it was like a much more satisfying experience of doing that but it's kind of like well i can't do that forever it was like it was i'm glad i did it and it's fun to do and I, I got to be creative again um but you know i gotta eat so like somehow or other it's like you're gonna keep on making films and somehow get paid and you know <laughs> i i think um yeah it would be great to just see a bit more of that middle ground where you know you take something like the first john wick movie i think that was done for less than 20 million um mm -hmm. but damn you would never think from looking at it like they obviously just made every penny of that count absolutely but that's the kind of film where it, it's not like a, a studio's investing huge sums of money in it so that they're prepared to take a chance on like a, an unproven concept or something i know keanu reeves isn't exactly an unproven actor but you know um this this whole new franchise that they were starting to launch there um i i guess if we could get more films like that in that sort of price range 
that would have been um, a, a good compromise. And I kind of figured, I don't know, with the pandemic and everything, Hollywood might start to scale back their budgets a little bit and maybe invest a bit more money in smaller films of that sort of level. I, where... I have no idea where it's all going to go, really. I mean, it's like, it feels like at the moment, like indie films or whatever, it's just that 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 whole concept is just going to die a slow death somehow because I don't know how it can be sustained that people want to, you know, it's either going to television or it's going to be like mega budget movies and it seems like everything else in between might just like disappear. I hope not. Um, but, you know, I just, how do, how do, how are any filmmakers actually going to live? You know, yeah. The way the market it I mean, in in the UK, do they not get grants from the the British Film um, like Federation or something? Like, is there not like ways that they can um, get funding that way, or has that been done away with now? Uh, there was a time when there was some funding from the lottery. Yeah, uh, that that got um, the, the, the film council or whatever, but that's not happening anymore. Um, the BFI do some grants, but you've got to be doing this very, very specific kind of film to get any money from the BFI. Certainly the, the films that I make would never, ever get money from the BFI. <laughs> that's, right. that's, not, that's not their genre. Um, so, no, that's, that's tough. So you've got to like either try and pre-sell the movie or find uh, investors or whatever. So Yeah. Um, I, I don't know about you, like the sort of genre of films that I'm starting to get kind of tired of is is superhero movies. <laughs> like, I feel like we've had about 20 years of this. It's just swamped. I mean, it's just completely swamped. It's like that. That's that's all that's coming out these days. And even yeah. the films that aren't technically superheroes, their characters might as well be superheroes. Like, I haven't seen it because it can help to think. But Uncharted was like, you know, the kids mm. hanging out like a plane. The fact that he's played by Spider-Man is one thing, but like <laughs> behaving like Spider-Man anyway, he's just missing the suit. It's like he's still doing things that are like physically impossible for a human to do. And it's all done like with CGI or whatever. And it's like, yeah, I miss like Indy, you know, hanging from the underneath a truck where it's like a real guy in a real truck in a real desert. And, you know, and it's real. I love that. And, yeah. Um, that kind of stuff so uh, the superhero thing is like even like i've noticed over the years that the height at which a person can fall in a film and get up and walk away has slowly but surely like grown like it yep. used to be like maybe in the 70s or whatever you know this is kind of the hero that the era of ultra realism somebody like fell off a car be like ow you know they'd hurt maybe they get up and limp nowadays they're falling off like three or four story buildings and they're fine and they got to and they're not even then they're, they're not superheroes they're just regular people like you know even james bond doing it like you know this this ridiculous films that uh you know people just fall and get up and they're like what? just the the laws of physics have gone out of the window in hollywood and and it's killed the notion of um actual jeopardy yes so a lot of, for a lot of it. and even like the good ones um like john wick and stuff like that you, there's no real jeopardy in it because he's he's virtually a superhero, you know. He's virtually invincible. Um, yeah, I, I was gonna I was gonna say that exact thing. Um, like with Black Widow recently, um, there's a bit where she kind of gets flung off a, the edge of a building and like hits a bunch of stuff on the way down and then lands on the ground and like she gets up and off she goes. It's like yeah. a, a regular human that would have shattered like every bone in their body and like. You even do something like that in the descent, where like one of the girls falls down a chasm, and like yeah. her leg is like horribly broken, like bones sticking up through the and, the and end of it. A black widow is meant to be a regular person, like she's yeah. not a superhero. So like making her do things that Captain America can, can do is just like ridiculous. But I don't know, everybody likes that kind of stuff, so who can say? <laughs> yeah, I mean that that I guess that's the trap that we've fallen into because you know these big superhero movies are well one you've got superhero films and like they've just they've been making money hand over fist so obviously they're just going to keep doing them like why wouldn't they it's like a license to print money um and two you know when it comes to action movies that superhero vibe like you say is seeping into that as well so you don't get humans with regular abilities now you've you've essentially got superhumans who can 
you know, fall from crazy heights. They can take an insane amount of punishment um, because yeah. everything has to be amped up to that next level. Yeah, being shot in a movie now really isn't that much of a big deal. People get shot and just walk <laughs> up and it's fine. Like, you know, so, you know, there's that. I mean, I, I do like, you know, certain things like I love the Mission Impossible movies. And I, mm -hmm. because I do get a real sense that, like, Cruz is putting his life on the line when he goes out and makes a, a, a Mission Impossible movie. And I appreciate that. And, you know, I think those movies just seem to go from strength to strength. They're, they're, they're great. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's always one or two. I mean, not to say that I don't like all superhero films. You know, I, I, the, some of the Marvel ones I think are perfectly entertaining, a lot of fun, and great stuff in them. I thought the Batman, I really liked the Batman. It had its problems, but on the whole, I, the, the visual style and such like, I really enjoyed it. It's the amount of them. It's it's the fact that, that there's it's the deluge. Of, of superhero films is like that's all there is yeah uh, that's that's what, that's what gets me i like a bit of variety we um I, I think we were on friday night tights which is like a you know a live stream show that we do sometimes and i, I occasionally guest on it um and i was mentioning this very point of like not only now have you got you know an endless wave of superhero movies but now you've got tv shows as well because um all of these different networks are trying to get them onto their streaming services so disney yeah. plus you know there's just show after show of like third tier marvel superheroes or you know um the the floodgates have been opened for new star wars shows um, and like it's it's just a bunch of stuff that nobody cares about you know I, I never wanted to see a boba fett tv show but there it is on screen you know and, and it's just what is that thing once as soon as there's something that that makes some money or some success it's like it's got to be milked and squeezed and pounded yeah and flogged relentlessly to get every little ounce out of it and it just kills the whole idea dead at the end of the day and yeah I didn't want to see a Boba Hurt TV show either. <laughs> I kind of yeah. thought, you know, the Mandalorian kind of served that purpose. I'm like, well, he's, you know, he's, it's not, it's not Boba Fett, but he might as well be. It's like, okay, we get it. I didn't want to see an, a totally different show with Boba Fett being lame in it. Yeah. I, I think the bit that made me laugh is the fact that he disappears from his own show for a couple of episodes and then like the Mandalorian just comes in and takes over. <laughs> it's like they ran out of ideas for him. I'll just leave. The least interesting character in his own show. That, that it really is, yeah. And it's a strange thing, um, but yeah, I think the Mandalorian probably just blazed that trail. Um, and now that those the floodgates have been opened, man, you're just going to get, you know, we're just going to get bombarded with all these different shows. There'll be, you know, one for Obi Wan Kenobi that's coming out, um, like. That that Cassian Andor from Rogue One is apparently getting his own show. Like there's just yeah. people that I, I would never even care about. I can barely even remember. Like Obi Wan Kenobi, fair enough, but like I don't think they're going to do him justice. So it's just like you say. I think they're just trying to like squeeze every penny they can get out of Star Wars. I, I don't know anybody who's waiting for the Cassian Andor show. Like <laughs> also, like you know, he dies at the end. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> We can go on an adventure. We know how it all ends up. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, jeez. I mean, it's just um, yeah. This is kind of where we're at with with franchises, I guess, at the moment. You know, everything's um, everything's been kind of taken over to just uh, squeeze a few more a few more pennies out of it. Um, it done... And it's just that notion that you know, but the thing like TV disproves the notion all the time in that. Original TV shows come along. They're not based on books. They're not based on anything. And people lap them up. They love them. And it just seems like you know, the studios are not willing to take any kind of risk with an original piece of material. It's like it's got to be an IP. It's got to be a book, whoever. Um, trying to, you know, and if they weren't gambling so much money on it, maybe they could take more risks. So it kind of be worth like for every 100 million movie or 200 million movies they make if they like just put that money and divided it up and made a bunch of 10 million movies that were original and interesting that would just keep the market fresh it would just keep things yeah alive you know and there's always that chance that one of those films could you know strike it big and go on to make like way back way more than its budget um and, and actually be a, a real profit really maker this could be good odds, but like, how are we ever going to find the next Tarantino or the next Scorsese or, you know, these great filmmakers, like how are they going to emerge 
because there's, there's no forum for them to emerge in mm. if they can't go out and make films. Yes, yeah, so it's a uh, it's a kind of strange market that we we're existing in now, and yeah, I just I do wonder how much longer it will go on like this before it starts to swing a different way, and you know maybe there will be more opportunities. Oh, like I know, indeed. yeah, audience revolution. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, I mean, all I can do, like uh, in my own tiny way, is like if I do spot movies that are are, you know, um, underappreciated or like the smaller films, is try and draw attention to them and like make people aware. It's like, oh yeah, we are still making good stuff these days, you know, believe it or not. Well, I, I always try. I'm trying to do it on my Instagram as well. Of like, I, I watch, you know, I, I post about like weird and obscure films that I watch, not necessarily new ones, but like old movies that, that I find that I was like, you know, you should check this out. It's really good. So, you know, try and do our little, try and do our little part. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are great movies out there. There are. Yeah. I mean, well, the, however, um, like, however many thousands of them get made. Yeah. Your extra shots are like, you know, picking up on great movies and just talking about them. That, that's exactly why I started that because, you know, I knew that, um, a lot of these ones that I talk about, they're not really going to be um, relevant for the main channel. Like it's maybe um, a bit more niche, but there are things that I just want you to talk about. And, you know, films from, from years back that I've watched and just thought, yeah, th those are really good. And people might not have heard of them or they might have passed them up nowadays. Um, going to put them out there and see if anyone's interested or if anyone remembers them. And yeah, a lot of the time there's been a great response to it. And I just love it when people will re reply and say, Oh, wouldn't have bothered to watch this film before or i'd never heard of it or whatever and i gave it a try really enjoyed it thanks it's great like they, they took my recommendation and they enjoyed that film that they might never have seen otherwise it's great that's that's what makes it worthwhile i suppose yeah absolutely um sorry i'm just trying to organize i've got to go and pick up my uh fiance from the train station <laughs> no no that's fine man <laughs> have we done um sorry yeah, no, that's I, um, I don't know if you'd see my office, but it's like full of uh, posters for old movies and things like that. So, yeah, I'm always trying to like find gems that, that I'd never heard of before. Or think also like I love um, now that uh, the Blu ray market has kind of become very much a collector's market. And so it's like more obscure titles are being released on Blu ray. Films that are like searched for for years are like suddenly like appearing. And, mm -hmm. uh, completing my collection i'm a big fan of physical media so yeah yeah i'm a hundred percent agree because um what we've started to see i guess more and more is um you know studios deciding that uh you know this old movie is a bit problematic we need to remove this scene or this reference or whatever um and it might just start with little things but then it just those are the kind of th things that just keep going and going and i really don't like the idea of you've got something that you've downloaded because you don't really own it then all you've really got is a license to download it and they can just change that original file for you and and before you know it it's been updated on your system and that's it you've lost the original then um and yeah what, what else are they going to start taking out you know it's just um i want to get the the original movies as they were intended by the artist that made them well yeah i mean there's, there's always that problem of reevaluating like historical pieces and things like that it's like you know i i, I any kind of, it's a form of censorship and I, and I hate any of that kind of stuff i think all, all of us do really um and yeah, I, I think everyone's sensible enough to realize, yeah, if a film was made in the 1940s or 50s or whatever, uh, it's going to have like outdated sensibilities compared to today. So what? Like that's how it was intended to be made. And you can either appreciate it or or you can't, in which case you, you maybe shouldn't watch it. But don't start trying to change the whole thing and expecting everyone to just buy into this new version that's been sanitized like with you know yeah i mean that's, yeah well that's, that's you know it's like it's a sanitization of history as well of like um trying to re re remake history via film so that people will think that shit happened in the past that did not happen and you know try and cover up the shit that did happen it's like i, I can't i can't bear that kind of stuff it's like we've got to yeah sh show, show us what's and all like yeah, we, we did stupid stuff in the past. So show it, you know, don't try and hide it. It's like, so yeah, that, that bugs me. That's No, I think we would all agree. And that's 
yeah, well, to go back to your point, I guess that's why it's such a great idea to have physical media. It's like, you know, once you've got something on disc, that's it. You can you can put it in your player whenever you want. And that's yeah. your version. Nobody can change it. And that's that's great. It's uh you know, it it seems to be a, a bit of a vanishing art now or a vanishing like way of doing things. Um people are just like, no, why would I have to put a disc into my machine? I can just press a button, download it. That's it. <laughs> it's just not the same. Well, also, like, well, you know, where I live at the moment, the internet's a bit shit, so like, streaming isn't one hundred percent reliable anyway. So you always get glitches, or some days we're like when it's the internet's down and crap like that. It's like, but I can always shove in a Blu-ray or a DVD or whatever, and it's like, yep, yeah, it's there, great, watch it, done. Good to go, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing I was going to ask, because like, I know you mentioned you have to you have to scoot off at some point. Um, what I normally do is just answer a few super chats when. Um, you know, we're getting to the end of a, a stream. Um, I don't know if you've got enough time to answer a few of them um, or if, you know, you need to, to head off. It's totally up to you, man. Um, uh, one second. Let me just, I'm going to find out when this, <laughs> I wait for a bloody train again. <laughs> uh, that's cool. Um, just while we're going here, I'll, I'll see what chat's but, Yes, I mean, I've got, uh, uh, yeah, no, I've got, um, yeah, I've got like 10 minutes or so. So, yeah, okay. please. Okay. We'll go through a couple because I'm sure um, a lot of them will be for you anyway. So just give me one second and I'll just bring them up. Okay, so uh, the first one that came in tonight was from RRTNZ. And he said, Hail Drinker and Neil, I loved your work on Black Sails. Can you tell us about some of the challenges and rewards of directing um, the amazing first episode, please? Have a pint on me, lads. Cheers, mate. <laughs> Pint of rum. Yeah. Um, it was a black. Oh, I got to do a pirate. You know, holy shit. And that's another thing. Like, TV was was great for working on TV is great for because like I never would have got to do a pirate movie, but I got to do this amazing pirate TV series. Um, challenges. Um, there was plenty of challenges. I mean, we were down in Cape Town, where it's very very windy. And um, the, the TV company, I think it was Stars or whatever, they spent like $2 million building a full-size galleon on a vehicle. Uh, they built it, this vehicle from scratch, and um, the whole thing was like so it could tilt backwards and forwards mm -hmm. with this whole galleon on top of it. And they spent a fortune doing it. And part of the problem was is that because it's so windy in, in Cape Town, if you put the sails up, the whole thing would have just like gone over. Like, <laughs> the sails could only go up on any of the ships if the wind was less than something like seven knots or four knots or something like that. Um, but this thing, like rocking backwards and forwards, was they gave it a test, and I was like, I was like, kind of sneaky, and I snuck onto the ship so that they could test it while they, while they were testing it. So I was standing on the bridge, and it was like that, whatever. And I was the only one on the ship, and that was really cool. But what they very quickly discovered was that it could only work. If there was fifty people on the, no more than fifty people on the on the ship when it was working, I said, "Well, that's great, but the crew's fifty and the cast is fifty. So, which one are we going to have on deck? Like, which one are we going to have on the ship when we're filming?" Um, so they ended up having to basically just like lock it in place and never use the the gimbal that they built. Aww. These kind of things that are like, oh man, what a disaster! But yeah, I mean, the sets they they built basically a. So no, it wasn't a film at the sea. They they built a lake and made a beach, you know, to be the sea. <laughs> right. <laughs> studios. Uh, and next to it was an entire town. And it was like just the most amazing sets I think I've ever worked on. Not only because of the scale, but the detail as well. Beautiful, beautiful detail. Um, but yeah, I mean it was it was just awesome. I got to do pirates and cannons and sword fights and all kinds of crazy shit. I mean, you know, pirates and sword fights and cannons going off. Like, what more can you ask for in life? Throw a bit exactly. of rum in there and you're good to go. Blow people up, <laughs> have them hanging off the rigging and just hang out on fucking sailing ships. It's just awesome. Yeah. Brilliant <laughs> stuff. Um, Ghost in the Craig said, uh, Burps, there's a VIP lounge. Uh, yeah, so this is the this is the new like show that I've got. Because I was trying to think of a name for it. I was like, I'm going to, you know do this every once in a while where I'll bring in an actor or a director or something to talk to. And yeah, that seems like the name for it. That's what chat suggested. So we're going with VIP lounge. Oh, um, VIP lounge. Sounds about yeah. right. Yeah. 
Um, James Kelly said, uh, two-part question. Um, I first heard about dog soldiers around 2004. My buddy's dad was watching it on TV and he was really into it. I'm pretty sure my friend and I were playing Nintendo 64, <laughs> so we didn't see it. Fucking hell, that's a blast from the past. Um, my <laughs> friend's dad said it had good action and liked the scene involving alternative retreat and covering fire. Uh, thank you for the fond memories, sir. <laughs> okay, good. Um, yeah, I, 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 I did like that bit. Um, yeah, like um, when they're when they're getting chased through the woods by the werewolves, yeah. and um, there's that that they're falling back by squads, so someone's providing cover and fire while the next group runs backwards. It's it's good stuff. Yeah, again, it was all that thing of like you know I did my research and and try to get it as accurate as possible. as like how do the soldiers do this shit? You know, because I was when I pitched it to the cast, I always said like this is a soldier movie with werewolves. It's not a werewolf <laughs> movie with soldiers. So, like, you know, I think they all bought into that whole idea. Yeah, like trying to apply like military tactics to fighting werewolves. There's just something awesome about that. <laughs> hey, whatever uh, works. Yeah, yeah it's totally. Um, Kung Fu Hot Dog said, uh, Mr. Marshall, I love dog soldiers. I watch it every Halloween. Loved Spoon and Sean Pertwee, who, like you, is an absolute legend. Thanks for some great movies, man. Well, thank you for watching them. Yes, and Pertwee is a legend. Yes. Did he actually get drunk for that scene where he's he where he's he really he got did. drunk? That's he did, brilliant. Proud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he, he he did. He came to me before we filmed and he said, "Would it be okay if I you know had a had a little drink before the just to loosen me up a bit?" I think he had more than just a little drink. I think he was quite sozzled. But uh, no, it, it, I mean he never got his lines or anything like that. But it was it was just it lended that authenticity, and I love that. Brilliant. No, definitely. You, you can kind of tell, like, that's the kind of, uh, that's the kind of drunkenness that's not just coming from acting. Like, he's proper rowdy and, and pissed. <laughs> but it, it, it actually produced, it produced one of the funniest moments on set because uh, there's a point where, um, you know, Kevin McKidd punches him and yep. then he gets up and he goes, oh, you pussy, you uh, hit me properly, whatever. And then Kevin McKidd punched him again. Well, Kev actually hit him in the nose on that shot and, like, blood from his nose went flying across the set. <laughs> and uh, we heard a bit of a crack. I don't think it broke his nose, but it certainly hit him in the nose. And then you know, we called cut, and um, Sean's sitting there with blood streaming out of his nose. And um, the first AD shouts, uh, can we get the doctor? And, like, Sean in his, like, semi-drunken state just says, my dad's a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that is a good comeback. <laughs> we were like, oh, yeah, like that. I love it. <laughs> no, that's good stuff, man. I love it. Um, uh, Def A says, "Love your work. Keep up, keep up telling the real message." Cheers from Finland. Thanks, man. Cheers for that. Um, Stybike B says, uh, "In my opinion, interactive storytelling, like in video games, are a natural evolution. I mean, what else movies? What else in movies can you do? Friendly reminder to do cyberpunk. Uh, yeah, I was. Um, I don't, video I don't know game how that works." works in the cinema though it's just like yeah a bunch of people screaming at the the, the the cinema screen like say no do this do that and then characters like i haven't got a clue what to do yeah it's like <laughs> i'm getting 50 different things you have to do a vote like a voting system you know if the majority of people say you should do one thing like press a button or something <laughs> yeah we're gonna stop the film to have a vote have yeah <laughs> we're doing it live we're doing it live um yeah, I'll, I'll need to play Cyberpunk. Like, I put it off because um, it was buggy as fuck when it launched, and I think they finally patched it, and it's kind of working now. So, um, yeah, I'll give it a go. Um, Robert Feldman says, Mr. Marshall, I love Rona Mitra. What was it like working with her, and do you have a good story for us from the time on set? Um, okay, so, um, you know, she was, she's, like, incredible. I know she's like she's she, she breeds horses, uh, rescues horses, and and does all this kind of incredible eco stuff at the moment and stuff like that. So she's pretty, she's a fascinating character. Like we were both uh, obsessed with um, the dark crystal and stuff. That's what we bonded over when we started to make the movie. When I first met her, she was like she's a dark crystal fanatic. Um, but yeah, I mean she was great. She was, she did a lot of stunts and um, she can ride, so she did all her riding stuff. Um, you know, she was, uh, uh, for me, it was just a real shame that, um, she didn't kind of cash in on it so much. Um, uh, you know, it, it was a pain in the ass that Doomsday wasn't a bigger hit than it was, but, um, I really kind of wanted her to go on to be like, like what I think she could have been, she could have been like, uh, like Mila Jovovich or whatever. 
um, you know, really up there with the, the iconic kind of action action woman. Um, but she was phenomenal in Doomsday. She was phenomenal in Doomsday. It's real, like, tough. And she looked convincing. That was the thing. That's why I cast her. I was like, I believe that she can do all the things that she does in the movie. She's, um, yeah, she's definitely got a bit of musculature to her. Like, you can tell she trains quite a bit for all this stuff. And, yeah. Um, she really she's clearly that. in good shape for Doomsday, you know? Um, yeah. And, yeah, like you say, you know, she, she had the look. You know, she had, um, you know, pretty good acting ability. Um, I think she could have, she could have done, she could have um, kind of carved out that niche as an action hero. Um, she could have played Lara Croft, like um, when they cast Angelina Jolie. I think they could have cast Rona in the role. Yeah, well, and I think... she was, uh, she was one of the Lara Croft models. Like, yes, when, you know when they did the model shit. That's kind of why she first sort of came to fame. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a Lara Croft model, so yes, yeah, she totally would have been good in that role. Yeah, ah, that's a shame, um, but. Yeah, she was in. Um, I saw her quite recently in Strike Back uh, a few years back. She was in that, and yeah. she was she was really good there. I just saw like she just posted something on her Instagram. She's shooting an action movie at the moment. So, oh, you know, cool. It was yeah, a post still... like, punching somebody in the face. So I was like, get in there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Samuel the Infamous says, I count the descent among the very best of horror films of the 2000s. Thank you for the quality entertainment, Mr. Marshall. Well, thank you very much. I'm very, very, um, very pleased you like it. I'm proud of it. Uh, Ryan Patterson said, The Descent is a movie that stuck with me, and I saw it three times in theatres, and one of my favourite movies to describe to someone who hasn't seen it. It's always interesting seeing it with someone who's never seen it before. Yeah. So uh, there's a screening of it in the uh, they're showing it in a cave. Uh, in, <laughs> Brilliant. Somewhere in the Peak District. I can't remember. It's on like on the 30th of March or whatever. It's being screened in a cave, which I think would be an awesome experience. And no. uh, we're doing a screening in London on the 8th of April and um, for the descent to, to because the, the soundtrack's being released on vinyl. And so we're doing a special screening and Q&A with me and the composer. So it'll be interesting to see it on the big screen again, but also like potentially with a, an audience it's great when you watch it with, with people who've never seen it before. It's mm. always I kind of imagine people like cringing and squirming when the characters are trying to slither through these tiny little like rock <laughs> passages. Because yeah, if you're if you're claustrophobic, that has got to be a tough watch. It's good watching. Well, I well, you know because I've seen it so many times now. So like what I tend to do is watch the audience. And yeah, during those those sequences, it's like you can see the how uncomfortable it makes people. <laughs> It's great. <laughs> it's what you want in a horror movie. Um, uh, DM said to me, uh, Chris, "Critical drinker, who critiques your books? Any movie offers?" Um, I don't don't know of, of anyone who really critiques my books, to be honest with me. Um, but as for movies, yeah, um, sold the movie option for the first book, um, so that's currently in development. I mean, it's it's one of those things where I, I guess Neil can. Um, empathize with the kind of problems that you have of getting funding for a movie and then um, if you're not in the uh, sort of big studio system you've got to do a, this big patchwork quilt of, of deals and investments and um, right. trying to find the right locations to shoot in locations is the easy part it's the, it's the money and the deals and the yeah all the other shit you've got to get through to get get to that point um yeah no it's and it's slow it's that's the thing. It's just, it's the whole business is slow. Yep. Um, fortunately, I don't have to do any of that stuff. I just sit back and let them get on with it. So <laughs> it's easy for me, I suppose. Yeah. Um, farewell, Thunderchild said. Love your work. In fact, I once prattled on with the handsome man with you for three hours on stream talking about dog soldiers. Yeah, that was the guy who did a stream with me about it. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> this man walks into a bar with a dog on his arm. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great line. <laughs> and then a cow falls on top of him. <laughs> and we'll never know the ending of that joke. <laughs> I know. Um, JJ said, uh, loads of new content. Thanks. Uh, Mauler taking notes. Um, <laughs> Mauler's busy these days. Um, Farewell Thunderchild also said, Megan's motivations. Please clarify, uh, we were split on this one. Um, yeah, that was an interesting one. And I don't know if you've got time to explain it because I know you're quite short on time right now. But. Um, uh yeah, I have to go in a minute. But um, Megan's motivations. Christ, you asked me questions from 20 years ago. Um, yeah. <laughs> I expect you to remember perfectly every moment of this script. <laughs> uh, 26 years ago when I wrote the script, it was like coming up with Megan's motivations. Jesus. Um, no, she, I always think I, like she is 
she went up there looking for werewolves. She found them, got bitten by one or whatever it is, got attacked by them, became one. And when the soldiers came along, I think for the first time, she kind of thinks, maybe these guys can get me out of this situation somehow. Um, and starts kind of like, she, she backs them to a point. But then at some point, and you're never really sure where, she's going to like, you know what? I'm never going to, I can't get out of this. What am I going to do? Go back to a normal job and like turn into a werewolf every month. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. no. So it's like, you know, at the end of the day, you just got to accept who you are and run with the pack, as she says. And then she sells them out. Was she being like held hostage up there, do you think, by the, the family that lived in that place? Were they like keeping her there against her will? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. If she was, I, I, in, in my head, it was always that she'd actually like, once she'd become a werewolf, she was kind of like, she hooked up with one of the one of the other werewolves or whatever, and you know, so because one of the alpha males or something, mm -hmm. and uh, and stayed there because like where where else is she going to go? But um, and she didn't see a way out at that point. The soldiers kind of provided her with a possibility of a way out, even though it didn't work out. But up until that point, she was like, oh, I'm just going to have to stay here. Mm -hmm. Well, there we go. That is Megan's motivations. There you go. Um, yeah, man. Um, obviously, conscious that uh, you'll probably have to drop off in a minute, so I won't. Uh, I won't pest you with, with any more super chat. So, I'll uh, no, I do, I do, uh, yeah, I do actually have to make a move now. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, listen, man. It, it's been a real pleasure talking to you tonight. Um, I appreciate you coming on for this, and uh, yeah, it's been a great, uh, great honor to talk to like one of the guys who you know he directed some of my favorite movies. It's cool, <laughs> you know. Well, hopefully, I'd, like, I'd love to come back sometime because I've got a new movie coming out in August and I'm hoping that it'll be right up your street because it's wow. very much in a similar vein to Dog Soldiers. Perfect. Uh, no, when you when you get that movie out, um, it would be great to have you come back. We can talk some more about it. Um, hopefully, I can watch it and review it. And um, yeah, it should be a blast, man. And also, I mean, the other thing is that I'd love to just come on and gas on about other movies, not necessarily mine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, bring you back for like a happy hour or something and, you know, maybe pick a, a film or two that you're interested in that, that you really enjoy and then we can chat about that for a little while if you're up for it. Absolutely, well for it. Perfect. Cool. All right, man. Well, Neil Marshall, thank you very much for being on tonight. It has been great for talking to you um, and sharing a few drinks with you as well. Well, at least I've been drinking. I don't know about you. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to have a drink shortly. I've got to drive now, but now I'm going to drink. <laughs> All right. Cheers, man. Well, thank you very much for that. All right. Cheers. Later, mate. Bye now. Bye-bye. All righty. It is just me now. I will finish up the Super Chats for you guys and uh, call it a night, I think. Uh, so what was the next one here? Um, from Charles Hurst says, Doomsday was underrated. Uh, Leanne Leinberg uh, with crazy tattoos. Hell yes. Yeah, she was oddly sexy in that movie. Um, yeah, she was clearly in very good shape and her outfit made the absolute most of it. So I'm not fucking complaining. She was pretty hot. Um, that's what I, I like in my women. <laughs> Borderline insane and homicidal maniacs. Perfect. Uh, Calex gave me a US dollar. Thanks, mate. Um, Ghost in the Craig said, cheers and pleasure having you on, Neil. Yeah, it was great to have Neil on. He was a good guy. Uh, Farewell Thunderchild said, let sleeping dog soldiers lie. Indeed. Um, MSD Gaming says, if you did Dog Soldiers 2 in Scotland, would you give the drinker a cameo? Well, I'm going to answer for Neil there and say, yes, he would. In fact, I would be the star of the fucking movie. Um, well, I could probably wear, I could play a werewolf if nothing else. So <laughs> that'd be fucking great, though. Hopefully they do get to make a Dog Soldiers 2 the right way. Um, play Kingdom Hearts One Wings says, you think Jelly Bean is funny? Uh, I do not know. So I'm sorry I can't answer that one, mate. Gilly Wright's comics said, was fascinated with the descent and dog soldiers. They're both on my go-to horror list. And Neil, you're inspiring. Drinker, keep up the awesome content. Thank you, man. And hopefully you enjoyed the stream tonight. Soul Hunter 909 said, uh, do you actually drink before you make your videos? Always. And I drink before and during and after my live streams as well, because it makes it more fun. Rami Goodwin says, what are your most anticipated movies of the year? <laughs> It's 2022. This isn't a time for anticipating good movies. That time has passed. I, I, I don't really know what's coming out this year that I'm really excited about. Um, I think Top Gun Maverick's coming out this year. Hopefully it hasn't been pushed back to 2023. 
I'll be quite interested to see that. Um, yeah, there we go. He's more booze now than man. <laughs> Twisted and intoxicated. Um, what's the next one? Russell Whitfield gave me £10. Thank you very much for that. Appreciate your donation, man. Uh, Zam Valen said, here's to some critical drinking, mate. 2022 is going to need it. Uh, I've got a feeling it is, yeah, but I'll be here to drink and critique. OMG Puppies said, could the three Hobbit movies be fan edited into one good movie? They probably could, actually, yeah. Um, there's a whole lot of fat you could trim out of them. So hopefully if you take all that out, you might have a half-decent film. I don't know what you could do about the over-the-top set pieces, though. Some of them are just ridiculous, but you kind of need them to progress the story. So I'm not sure what you'd do there. Russell Whitfield said, I'm working with Leanne and Vlocky on, S- on a South African film funded by Capstone and Manette. They want a director that can do action. I said, Neil, can we talk? Um, I, I do not know if Neil would be available for stuff like that, but um, probably the best way to do is just contact him through Twitter, I think, or, or his, his uh, business email address. Welsh Nick said, Korea has broken the Western mold. It really has. Producing good TV and um, not really interested in the message, just good stories. Deleted Scenes said, Mr. Marshall, thank you for Dog Soldiers and Centurion. My late father was a fan of both. Have you seen the Western Old Henry? I think you'd like it. Uh, I have heard of Old Henry. Um, People were mentioning it to me a couple of um, weeks back on a different live stream. And um, yeah, a lot of people seem to like that one. I haven't seen it yet, though. Uh, OMG Puppies. Just actually, when you were talking about your father enjoying um, Dog Soldiers there, that was how I watched it it was my dad who was watching it one night and he was like yeah it was a good horror film you want to watch this like yeah fuck of course i'll watch it uh, and the rest is history so I've got good memories of that film um omg puppy said love dog soldiers i love it when a movie comes out that's creative and different and also a pleasure to watch i mean it's not a hollywood formula film and it's not a bad art film yeah it's just a fun movie made with like real passion and enjoyment and that's exactly what you get from it uh, your Mazda, give me a pound. So thanks for that, matey. Uh, what's the next one? Uh, your Mazda says, forgot to have a message. Boz. Anyway, love from Kilmarnock, matey. Thanks for that, man. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's all the super chats. Um, yeah, there you go. Uh, if I had a check for $35 million, I would give it to Neil. Yeah, and he would probably make an awesome fucking movie with it, or several awesome movies. Uh, yeah, if only I had more guys like him, you know, working in Hollywood right now, it would be great. Um, here's one. Yeah, your explanation of why modern movies suck was eye-opening. When did we get a review of The Usual Suspects? I'm glad you enjoyed that those videos, because I've done several of them now. And Usual Suspects, um, yeah, it's been a few years since I've seen it, um, but it's a fucking classic movie, so it's definitely a a candidate for extra shots, if nothing else. Uh, Give me time, I suppose, and I can get right on that. Uh, I think that's all of them. Um, I just got here from the real BBC. Nice. Uh, They must have finished then for the night. What's the next one? Diano, great interview. Looking forward, sorry, looking forward to more shows from the lounge. Well, hopefully, yeah, we'll have some more good ones coming up. And um, yeah, this is a neat little thing that I guess I've got the opportunity to do now is talk to guys like Neil and um, actors and stuff like that, and just uh, you know, hear the other side of the um, the industry, the, the bit that I don't really get much exposure to otherwise, and none of us do really. So yeah, it's great to to hear stuff like this. It's really. Interesting when Neil was talking about things like Hellboy and, you know, how much studio interference there is and, like, really how little creative control directors have. It's It kind of sucks. You know, it kind of explains a lot about why so many movies turn out shit these days. Um, but, yeah. Um, I think probably what I'll do is finish up there. Um, for all you guys that tuned in, I hope you enjoyed this stream tonight. Um, I know it was a little bit outside my normal stuff. Um, but yeah, I'll try and do a few more ones like this because it's really enjoyable to talk to guys like Neil. Um, and yeah, and you'll catch me on Open Bar on Thursday night. And we'll, uh, yeah, we should have a decent panel as always for that. And um, yeah, that'll be my next live stream. So for the time being, that's all I've got for today. So go away now.